Good evening to you. I want to discuss the present COVID situation globally, the issues that are involved. I will not run through all the issues. One real pressing issue is the rush for the vaccine. Even Dr. Anthony Fauci commented that the rush UK had for the vaccine to get it approved was a little unusual. Of course, he later apologized. Fact is that the rush was unusual. Uh, CDC or US has not granted approval still for the Pfizer vaccine. But UK very quickly granted approval. So what's really happening? I like to reiterate or summarize, itemize what, what the run-up to the rush for the vaccine. So Pfizer is doing an mRNA vaccine with BioNTech Germany. Then Moderna is doing uh, the same mRNA vaccine. The, the technicality of how they deliver the piece of mRNA into the host cell, host cell is a little different. Pfizer uses a nanomolecular size lipid droplet to wrap the mRNA because the mRNA is unstable otherwise. So when the mRNA is delivered to the host cell, host cell will produce the spike protein of COVID-19. Because it is the spike protein that is used by COVID-19 to enter into the host cell by attaching to the ACE2 receptor. So I do have a concern now when the virus itself gets into the host and through the spike protein gets into the host cell, then the virus will produce not only the spike protein, but virus will also produce the N protein, the M protein and the E protein. It is the M protein that disrupts the hemoglobin and it is the E protein that makes the virus spread from cell to cell. The very tricky nature of this virus is that it does not have to come out to the interstitium and meet the immune system. It can go from cell to cell and destroy an entire lung. Uh, so if the mRNA piece that produces the spike protein only is delivered to the host cell, I do have a reasonable worry that whether it will produce too much of the spike protein faster than antibodies can be made against the spike protein. That's the theory, that body makes the spike protein and body will also make the antibodies. So, this is the first time mRNA piece of a virus is delivered into a human cell, human, a human host. This is the first time. And that, and because it's a new technology, one would think it should not be rushed through. So many others have uh, taken up the position why they're rushing through. But let's get on to the molecular biochemistry of the virus, the, the mRNA process. So mRNA will produce the spike protein. And when the host cell is producing antibodies, it is expected that the T cells will be attracted with to, uh, to recognize this foreign protein. But since the foreign protein now has been made by my own cell, how much the body will consider it a foreign protein is an issue, is an issue. Then we all know that when a foreign protein is produced or introduced, body makes neutralizing antibodies and body makes non-neutralizing antibodies. Then the non-neutralizing non antibodies by, are called binding antibodies. They bind with the foreign protein and there is a antibody dependent enhancement, ADE, which goes on to produce the immune inflammatory cytokine reaction. Will this happen with any one of these viruses? Uh, so the Oxford virus, which is now redoing phase 3 trials, is using a modified adenoma, chimpanzee adenoma, adenoma virus to deliver the COVID mRNA to the host cell. The Russian Sputnik virus is using a human adenoma virus to deliver the 
COVID-19 MRA into the host cell. Now what Sinovac and Sinopharm are doing we don't know. Many other viruses are on online or, or in the process of being protected. So what will happen if the mRNA produce spike protein? Now remember mRNA comes from outside, joins our, our Golgi system and our RNA system and produces the spike protein. Uh, what will happen if B cells are stimulated? There will be a huge, there's a possibility of a real immune inflammatory reaction. Then nobody knows when, when the person is challenged by the wild virus, whether there would be an exaggerated re response and a, a, a bad clinical disease, because this has happened before. So when the SARS-CoV-1 virus was being tested in primates and other coronavirus vaccines have been tested on cats, when the, after vaccination, when the animals met the wild virus, it caused fatal disease. This has happened before. So we, then we get back to now, a little more of the run up to the virus. So these are the concerns, then there are other concerns that Pfizer has still not put out a safety schedule. Then there are objections that, then now you can, I can send you the clips, I'm Dr. Lal Mendes, I was head of the Department of Pharmacology in a state medical faculty in Sri Lanka. So my primary training is pharmacology. So when I speak on hydroxychloroquine or drugs, I speak from my own authoritative, authentic training. And on pharmacological subjects, I am published on PubMed, a treatment of migraine, irritable bowel syndrome, epileptic drugs, uh, low-dose aspirin, normal uh, NSAIDs, uh, L-DOPA. So these are some of the things I am published on besides some other publications that I had while I was the registrar to the professor of medicine, Colombo. Uh, I, I told you that to give you my authentic background. So when I had to speak on viruses, virology and immunology, though I have training, I have to also draw from others who are m more experts in their field. Uh, so this is, uh, the, there are worries also that safety standards are not yet published, uh, safety levels and so on, and a big objection that the vaccine has not been given to above 55 years or children, not given to immunocompromised people. So since most of the uh, drastic clinical features were above 70, uh, will, be, will this be, a, was this effective clinical trials? The question has been raised. Uh, then also that uh, MHRA, the regulatory authority on medical and health care, regulatory authority of UK rushed to approve when CDC UK, uh, US has not approved, that U US F FDA has not approved is an issue. Why was the rush in the UK to, uh, to approve this vaccine? Before Pfizer is US based. Why, why did US approve? Did they rightly go through? So Dr. Fauci, uh, raised the issue, but he has also apologized. So now run up to the, now there are two ex-Pfizer scientists, Dr. Wodag and Dr. Michael Yeadon. Dr. Michael Yeadon for many years was their respiratory sciences research officer and Dr. Wodag was their public health science. They have launched, I can send you the clip, uh, please send a WhatsApp to my WhatsApp number plus 94 77 49 59 214. Uh, then I can send you their clip. So my effort today is to explain to you what the problem is, not to get you to come to conclusions. This is not an anti-vaccine talk. This is a scientific talk on the two sides of the issue. So Dr. Wadag and Dr. Michael Yarden has launched a petition regarding the dangers they see of the vaccine. So this is what they are saying. They are saying the same protein structure of the spike protein, of the COVID spike protein, is shared by the syncytin-1 protein of the human body. Syncytin-1 protein is found is, is, is what goes into making the placenta. So when the zygote, human zygote, after 
after fertilization, when, when the sperm and the ovum come together and the zygote is made, it becomes uh, 4, it becomes 8, 16, 32 and 64 blastocyl and then it comes from the fallopian tube into the into the mother's womb and then the syncytin protein develops around the blastocyl and that protein has a similar structure to the spike protein of COVID-19. So there's a reasonable worry that the antibodies formed against the COVID-19 spike protein will act against the syncytin of the placenta and syncytin is also a vital part of sperms and gametocytes. So it has been researched, this, this risk is documented. So if you want clips on this or citations on this, just send me a WhatsApp message to that number I mentioned. So there is a real issue that, and this, this is the letter that Dr. Wardag and Dr. Michael Yardan are launching, letter to the European Union Authority for recognition approval, and they are launching a public petition saying, don't agree to this and it is on the web. Yeah, I can send you the clip policy. If you just do Yadon, Y-E-A-D-O-N, Pfizer, you, it'll come across. You'll come across it. Now, meanwhile in Portugal, uh, a senior lawyer took the government to court alongside scientists who are 65-year-old kind of scientists, old school scientists who did yeoman service and they build up a world of science. They will build up a world of science with no God. Now, 45-year-old scientists have got into significant positions like Lancet Editorial, New England Journal of Medicine Editorial. Somehow, the British Medical Journal has survived the onslaught of big pharma and vaccine industry on medical journal publishing. So when Lancet had to retract the article, uh, uh, that was decrying, that was against hydroxychloroquine by a company called Sugisphere, people connected to a company called Sugisphere with no academic background. They published an article in Lancet, a major article, but it had to be retracted. A retraction had to be done because of fraud and error. It was not only error. So when a major uh, scientific journal where people trust have, have to do a retraction, it's a terrible thing. You can't trust the scientific quality of a journal like that. When we were younger, first thing we would do when we go to the SLMA is to read the Lancet uh, the, for whatever updates. So uh, th there is a record like that, that there's a group of younger scientists who have got into positions of power, visibility, influence, also working closely with drug companies. They have launched their own companies own companies. They are in universities but they have launched their own companies and drug companies, big pharma is funding their drug companies to do research and they own data and they sell data. So a business is there. Now re there was an article some time back, I can send you the clip. Uh, BMJ took up the article about CDC, US CDC people uh, patenting their findings and selling it back to the public, charging for patents, when the funds for research come from government. So they, they were astonished when they discovered the extent of involvement of the pharma and vaccine industry with academics. Uh, so that's how it goes. Uh, so they're in the run-up to the vaccine scene. So I have discussed the worry about the vaccine. Uh, so you can read more on this. I can send you clips. Uh, then I need to tell you that you need to refer up World Doctors Alliance, uh, reputed scientists there such as Professor Dolores Cahill and the Great Barrington Declaration and their website Time of Recovery with Professor Sunetra Gupta who is Professor of Epidemiology, Oxford. Uh, so then I need to tell you that recently uh, there was a hearing by the US Senate about the importance of early home treatment. That presentation to US Senate was done by Professor Harvey Risch of Yale University and uh, 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 Dr. Peter McClough who has developed the early treatment schedule and Dr. Farid who has been practicing, uh, who has been treating quite a lot of 
people at home with hydroxychloroquine, zinc and low dose aspirin. So I have, I have done a full clip on this clip number 112. This one would be clip number 122. Uh, so, run up to the vaccine was this, the story, the narrative was. So, th there, are, there are scientists who are very push, pushing hard for vaccines. Therefore, they want to say that there is no effective, cheap, safe, effective medicine available. That's why hydroxychloroquine must run down. And many criticisms have been leveled at the recovery Oxford trial for its poor quality of uh, trial assembly, then suddenly stopping it. Then MHRA UK uh, intervened uh, saying hydroxychloroquine is not reliable and it is the same MHRA that has rushed to approve the uh, vaccine. So MHRA has vested interest in disqualifying hydroxychloroquine and going for the vaccine. So these are, uh, they are not anti-vaccine talk, this is about the scientific process that is uh, terribly at fault. So then there is the media that are pushing for the global view, uh, quickly the vaccine and that kind of thing. Then there's science pushing for a global view. Then there's economic that pushing for a global view. So when shutdowns happen, nations get poorer and global economy takes over and nations are impoverished. Then there are politicians in every country uh, who are pushing the global line and heads of state become captives and prisoners in that kind of situation. Uh, so uh, these are some of the things that have been happening. Then the run up to the vaccine making also involved the PCR testing. Now you need to refer up a site called Lockdown Skeptics. Please refer up that site that has very extensive uh, reputed scientists, much experience in the PCR process who are categorically saying PCR positive is meaningless in random testing. If a person has clinical features and the PCR becomes positive, then that can be an indication that may be COVID-19. Uh, so this is the state of uh, many scientists have spoken against doing random PCR, creating a pseudo pandemic. That's the word they have used. So you can see it on the Great Barrington Declaration. You can see it on the website Time of Recovery, Professor Sunitra Gupta, Professor Epidemiology, Oxford, and you can see it on the World Doctors Alliance. Uh, so the push for the PCR also that causes lockdown shutdown. Uh, then there's another process going on that is Portugal. In Portugal, a senior lawyer took the matter to court saying the government is not entitled to do shutdown and interfere with public life like this based on uh, false science and it was upheld supreme court of portugal upheld it and said government you can't do this kind of false. so the evidence they presented that pcr testing and, and and the pandemic narrative is at fault is wrong uh, supreme court of portugal accepted it i can send you the clip similar uh, court cases are being formed in Germany by a very well-known German lawyer, a scientist who are, you know, older scientists are working with him. So in every country there is a younger set of scientists who are very, very, what shall I say, very um, zealous for the vaccine thinking, the global thinking, and a more uh, older scientists who actually uh, were the foundational science people of our era, some are very famous names, they, including Professor Luke Mont Montagnier, uh, who said that this virus is definitely uh, all uh, SARS virus, uh, to which has been added at a furin point of genetic engineering, part of the HIV virus. Now clips are coming out saying this virus, COVID-19, is infecting CD4 T cells just the way the HIV virus is infecting. And there's a serious lymphopenia happening in some people that the CD4 T lymphocytes are being destroyed. And that is causing the severe COVID reactions, clinical diseases in some people. That is also documented. Now mainline science does not allow publishing of that kind of uh, research. So when Professor Carl Hennigan, director of Center for Evidence-Based Medicine of Oxford, 
and Professor Tom Jefferson published something about masks. Uh, they published it, it in the Infectious Disease website and when they put it up on the Twitter and their Facebook profile, uh, Facebook page, timeline, it was shut down saying fact checked and found false. Then Professor Carl Hennigan, who is Oxford Professor of Epidemiology and Director of Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, he was furious saying, who fact-checked me and saying I am false? This is a controlled clinical trial that I have done. So it's quite a battle like that. So the run-up to the vaccine rush, there is a coercion, there is a manipulation, so there is a set of media, set of scientists, set of economists, set of politicians who are pushing this line. And there are very reputed older scientists who are resisting this. Uh, so this is the presentation I wanted to do, particularly that early home therapy is not being done. And patients die at home and then patients are not uh, 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 hospital by the time they are hospitalized they are seriously ill because hydroxychloroquine and zinc should be given early as found by Professor D. De Raoult infectious disease pharmacologist in Marseille, France, a real uh, older generation, well-reputed scientist and a pharmacologist. Uh, he, now his, uh, his 3,700 case reports are based on 3,700 cases. His treatment of hydroxychloroquine, zinc and azithromycin is now on PubMed. Uh, so it's reliable science. And with reliable science, how they could disprove hydroxychloroquine and cry foul and look for some other remedy and quickly rush a vaccine, that is the narrative that needs examination. So I think I have said enough for today. I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you for listening. This was a short talk. Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, early, early treatment has been instituted. The last, last health circular has it. And in uh, all symptomatic people are getting it quite early and uh, death is prevented. So early home treatment is very important. ICMR, Indian Council of Medicine and Research have also recommended hydroxychloroquine and zinc as prophylaxis to be given to uh, frontline health professionals and other, uh, other places where many people are crowded and likely to, go, uh, likely to be infected. They have recommended giving prophylactic treatment of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and zinc. Uh, finally, one word about uh, this, uh, the local Sri Lankan made linktus called Sudarshini. It has uh, being cohomba, uh, the Androphilus uh, paniculata, and it is documented that it has quinine and it was used for malaria some time ago. So if there's any effect on it, it will be because it has a quinine factor, which is a primary molecule from which chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine come. But then when you have a, a hydroxychloroquine tablet with specific standardized dosage, why we want, we should be going into non-standardized uh, stuff uh, cannot be explained. So that's it. Thank you for listening. We'll meet again.